While I get to welcome you here tonight, I would just want to say that the mastermind behind tonight's program is our longtime friend, Judy Shaw. Um, Judy has had... Judy has had a long and distinguished career of public service in New Jersey, including as Governor Christy Todd Whitman's first chief of staff. And by the way, she was the first woman to ever serve as a governor's chief of staff. Um, a number of years ago, she moved to Massachusetts, and while she abandoned us here in the Garden State, she could not abandon politics. She quickly got involved up there and started telling me about a fantastic woman who was running for Attorney General, Mara Healy. And when Mara got elected, Judy kept telling me we had to get Mara to Eagleton. Happily, the stars finally aligned, and not just for schedules and for logistics, but also for the topic of tonight's talk, the role of state attorneys general in the current political climate. On an almost daily basis, we are reading about states challenging federal initiatives in the courts, whether it's workers' rights, environmental issues, reproductive health, access to health care, DACA, the travel ban, and the list goes on. I am delighted that we are able to bring one of the key leaders among the state attorneys general to talk about the important role that they are playing in this environment. And I also want to acknowledge the fact that in the audience this evening, we are joined by two of New Jersey's former attorneys general, Deborah Poritz, who also served as the Chief Justice of the New Jersey Supreme Court, the first woman Attorney General in our state and the first um, to serve on the, uh, as Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, and Paula Dow, who's next to <laughs> Justice Horace, who is now the presiding judge in Burlington County in the Superior Court. So we are really grateful that both of you are here. We had a little Attorney's General reunion um, <laughs> over dinner. Mara Healy was sworn in as Massachusetts Attorney General in January of 2015. Since taking office, she has tackled issues touching the lives of residents across her state, including the heroin and prescription drug abuse epidemic, escalating health care costs, workers' rights, and student loan costs. She is focused on strengthening consumer protections and on improving the state's criminal justice system. Mara has always been committed to ensuring that all citizens are treated fairly. When she served as the head of the Civil Rights Division in the AG's office, she was the architect of the state's successful challenge to the Federal Defense of Marriage Act and argued the case in federal court. She also helped defend the Massachusetts Buffer Zone Law, which protected women from being harassed, harassed at reproductive health care centers. As AG, she has advocated for marriage equality and in support of bills to fight discrimination against transgender people. She is an advocate for more equal and inclusive workplaces, and just four months into her term, she announced that her office would provide six weeks of paid family leave for all employees, making the AG's office the first state agency in Massachusetts to offer paid parental leave. The office has also helped shape state legislation that would expand opportunities for women in the workplace, including pay equity and pregnant workers' fairness bills. Now, I just want to say that as somebody who has spent a lifetime studying women in politics and at the Center for American Women in Politics, we talk a lot about women making a difference. Um, I think we have a clear example of why it matters to elect more women and what she has been able to do in the state of Massachusetts. Mara is one of only seven elected women who are currently serving as state attorney general. She is the first openly gay person to be elected as a state attorney general. And I am fairly certain, although we don't track this actually, it caught, maybe we should start to, but I'm fairly certain that she is also the first woman elected to any statewide position who previously played professional basketball. <laughs> So it is my pleasure to introduce to you Massachusetts Attorney General Mara Healy. <laughs> Well, thank you, Deb, and you're all looking at me like she's so short. I was a point guard. <laughs> right? Do we have any point guards in the room? 
<laughs> nice, right. So we're bossy, kind of, you know, in charge. General on the court, it made sense, right? The whole trajectory. Um, listen, I am so happy to be here tonight. Debbie, thank you so much for extending me this invitation for that generous introduction and for everything that you do for women in politics um, across this country. It's really, really remarkable and, and a great honor to be here. It's a great honor, too, to meet Ruth Mandel and uh, to come to know some of the members of this wonderful, wonderful institute named for Florence Eagleton. Um, really, really special, all that you have going on here. Particularly special as an attorney general to be here tonight with two greats, um, Generals Dow and, and Poritz. It's such an honor to, uh, to be able to talk to you. We were talking earlier about how some things have changed in many ways and in, in other ways they haven't. So more on that, but um, thank you both for being here. To Susie Wilson, who I know is a longtime Eagleton supporter. Um, more importantly though, she shared her grandson Harry when he was just a junior in high school. He came with oodles of energy as a volunteer to my campaign and remains a dear uh, volunteer today because we're up for re-election now and I expect to see him out soon. Um, <laughs> But, uh, but to, to Judy Shaw, um, Debbie mentioned Judy earlier, you know, I didn't know what I was doing uh, back four years ago when I set out on this unlikely course to become Attorney General. And the person I had at my side was Judy Shaw. And I was so lucky, I had no idea at the time uh, about her background and, and all that she had done. Um, but I was just happy to listen to somebody who had some seemed to make sense and was giving me good <laughs> advice. So it's really great to have come full circle. We had a great day in New Jersey. Uh, we started out this morning. Um, we were, we were, where were we this morning? We were in Trenton this morning. <laughs> and, uh, and had an opportunity to meet with an Eagleton alum, uh, Commissioner of Labor, uh, Rob Angelo and his team and talk shop. Also your new Attorney General here, General Graywall and his staff, that was terrific. Uh, we were then up to, to see some folks in Chatham and, and over here tonight, and you know, it's really been a wonderful tour of New Jersey for this, for this New Englander. You know, um, I don't have the privilege of calling myself a Scarlet Knight, but I want you to know, I want you to know that my partner is a proud alum. She graduated in 1982, as did her brother. Her father um, was a longtime professor here for over 30 years, and I know that she traces so much of her success to the banks of the old Raritan, or whatever that song is that she, <laughs> she's, she sometimes sings at home. Um, and, you know, I come from New England, and uh, I know that uh, a move was made a little while back to the Big Ten, but I know the roots of this great institution as one of nine colonial colleges. So to be here tonight among all of you, it's, uh, it's really wonderful. And, and indeed, we're thinking a lot about revolution. We're thinking a lot about democracy right now. Uh, we're thinking all about what truly makes this country great. And, uh, and it is for that reason that I'm delighted to be here as well. And finally, as just a personal point of privilege, I had to say that you know I showed up here tonight and uh, I was so excited, the very first person I saw, uh, to be honest, was Coach, was Coach Stringer. <laughs> so, you know, I was, uh, as a kid growing up in, in New Hampshire and a basketball player, I long admired Coach's tenacity and watched her over the years as she built programs. I kidded with her because I tried out for the Pan Am team in the Olympics uh, years ago, and I know she was on the coaching staff, and I didn't make that cut. But, um, <laughs> but uh, I so admire all that she has done for building the self-esteem and confidence of, of women and girls, of, of building leaders and building successful programs. And you know, I really admire uh, all that she has done, and it was really fun to, uh, to see her as well. So tonight, there's nowhere I'd rather be in this time in this, uh, in this country of ours. And I thought, you know, before I talk a little bit about the role of, of state AGs right now and what we're up to, I'd give you a little bit of sense of, of, of where I'm coming from and how I come to all of this. Because I'm here tonight to, to look forward uh, and to talk about the road ahead, but I can't do that without spending a little bit of time looking back. 
Long before I was the Massachusetts Attorney General, I was growing up in a small town in New Hampshire. I was the uh, oldest of five kids. We were raised in an old farmhouse. And uh, when I was a kid, I, I used to love on Saturdays, I'd go to the town dump with my dad. Now, dad was a selectman, so this was not just going to the dump uh, and taking the trash. This was actually a, a community convening spot. And my dad was one of three selectmen at the time. The other two were a dairy farmer and a guy who owned the lumber mill. And we would uh, go to the dump on Saturdays, and I'd stand there, a little girl next to my dad, and I'd watch him as people would come up to him and talk to them, talk to him about their issues. Maybe they needed a zoning variance, or you know, an elderly person was having trouble paying her heating bill. Um, someone else needed some brush cleared from the roadside by their house. You know, these were the the, the kinds of conversations. And, uh, and after that, we'd walk down to what was the general store. And in those days, it truly was the general store. You could cash a check, mail a letter, buy your groceries, get your fishing license, get your permit to burn brush, you know, the whole, uh, the whole thing right there. And uh, you see, in this way, it really was a true community. That's what I grew up with in this small town, a community that understood that people needed to, to have somebody there to deliver a, a quart of wood, you know, to help shovel them out after a, a blizzard. A community that truly gave me the foundation for values and for how I wanted to live my life. And a community that was there to support me in challenging times along the way. Just about the time I was getting to junior high, my mom became a single parent. And, uh, I remember a few things. I remember it was a significant turn of events for our family, and I remember people coming together to help us out. Um, one family helped us with a car. Another family would uh, occasionally deliver bundles of clothes uh, to, our, to our house, because they had, I'm one of five, they had five. They just happened to be about five to 10 years older, so it worked out really well. And, uh, and, and one thing that my mom did is, um, is she sold her wedding ring. I remember that. And she took that money and she paved half a basketball court behind our farmhouse. Now, you know, I think this was probably really good for her sanity because she had five kids under 10. And uh, it made a lot of sense to give them somewhere to, to play. But it gave me a chance to, uh, to, to go out there and to shoot jumpers and do my ball handling drills and probably, you know, what uh, led me to the career that I had there for a while. Growing up, though, I, I think we didn't have um, as much as some, I, I felt like we didn't want for anything because of the love of uh, my family and the strength there, but the strength of the community. My mom went back to work as a school nurse um, and had a strong union job that paid a decent wage. My grandfather taught us all how to drive. My grandmother mended our clothes and made our Halloween costumes. Everybody pitched in, and we all worked. I started out at the apple orchard, um, working in the pumpkin patch, and later, when I got my license, I got to, uh, to waitress over, over at the beach. This was kind of what we grew up with, and I learned from those experiences that if you worked hard, if you tried to do right and play by the rules, and if you had some people who were there to look out for you and give you a little help along the way, make those opportunities possible for you to make good on those opportunities, anything was really possible. And you know that's what drove me to dream big dreams for my future, to go to college, to go overseas and play ball, ultimately to go to law school, and finally to find my calling in the Attorney General's office. That's my story. I'm sure there are similar stories in, in the strains of, of, of all of your experiences um, about being raised to try to do right and about being raised to, to have compassion and care for the other and about being taught some basic values, that everybody deserves respect and the opportunity to realize their full potential and to have that potential recognized along the way. That to me is the essence of the American dream. And fundamentally, the recognition that this country belongs to all of us. You know, because here in this country, liberty and justice are supposed to be for all. Which, uh, which brings me to where I am now. 
Um, because looking out, some would say, well, those are words on a page, but they're just not so in practice. And, and I understand that. And that's one of the things that actually drove me to the Attorney General's office. I started out as head of the Civil Rights Division. I learned firsthand the power of a state attorney general, the ability to bring cases on behalf of people in your state who are hurting, um, who may have been wronged. Um, early on, I had the opportunity to serve as lead counsel in the state's challenge to DOMA, the Defense of Marriage Act. See, Massachusetts had led the way um, when it came to marriage equality. The problem was the federal government didn't want to recognize all of our marriages, only some, not those of gay couples. And so we actually brought a case alongside a case brought by private plaintiffs that said, you know what, as a state, we demand the respect of the federal government. Please treat our people equally under law. That case uh, went all the way up to the Supreme Court. We won. And thereafter, in another case that followed, marriage equality became the law of the land. I saw firsthand what the work of the people's lawyer, and that's what we call ourselves, can do, how it can impact the lives of others. You know, it was with some of that history that I uh, decided to run for attorney general. I was also totally naive and uh, blissfully ignorant about the process. Had I known then what I know now, I don't know that I would have, uh, would have jumped. But um, back in 2013, I was working in the Attorney General's office. I was overseeing all of the affirmative work in the office where we're bringing cases on behalf of the public to protect consumers of the environment or access to health care, you name it. And there was going to be an opening in that office because my then uh, boss was running for governor. I'd never been on a ballot. I'd never raised a dime or asked for a vote. But I thought in my heart that this was a great job and you could do a lot of good. People told me I couldn't raise the money, that I didn't know the right people, that it wasn't my turn. And in fact, um, I unfortunately didn't have much support from others in office. Um, it was a tough go, and the mayor of Boston and the governor of our state at the time were supporting my primary opponent. In fact, someone had suggested to me that I approach my primary opponent and ask if I might be considered for first assistant in his office. Now, I know that's not unfamiliar as a, as a narrative, and that the Insiders Club hasn't made a whole lot of room for women or people of color, or we could go on and on and on. Um, but I decided, well, it may not have been my turn, the time was right, and I was going to do it. And uh, I had that confidence, um, in part through my basketball playing days, I think, and, and facing competition and long odds with, with any season. But I think I had the benefit of so many women supported um, uh, through organizations like, like COP, really, when you think about it, who have made it possible for women to run and women to feel comfortable running. And you know that taught me that um, I didn't have to run a traditional campaign, that I could run a, the campaign that I wanted to run. And that's what I did. And we ran a really strong grassroots campaign. And on primary day, I was lucky to take home 346 out of 351 cities and towns in Massachusetts, and then went on to, to win the general. Now, um, I am going to talk about the role of state AGs, but I want to talk about the role of, of having a woman as AG and what that actually uh, means, because I think it matters to have women in office and women at the table now more than ever. We've seen the pictures of the men standing around the table making decisions about women's reproductive health care. We know the kind of decisions that are made and how those decisions get made in the absence of appropriate and diverse viewpoints and input. You know, on the other hand, thanks to some of you, we know what happens when you elect a woman to office, when those voices are at the table. And, um, and that's why I think things like the new leadership and ready to run programs, the bipartisan coalition for women's appointments, all of this is so, so important because the numbers are not what they should be. I think that our government works better when everyone is represented, and that's where we have to catch up. Now, since day one, I've tried to uh, lead from my office, and I'll tell you what that looks like. My first assistant, chief deputy, head of my state police unit, uh, the majority of my bureau chiefs, my state solicitor, the majority of employees in the Attorney General's office and the majority of attorneys are all female. 
Um, and that matters. It's what's possible when you elect a woman who then gets to hire and, and gets to promote from within. We also, as mentioned, worked to uh, change certain workplace policies that included paid uh, parental leave, but also mandatory unconscious bias training for all of our employees. We worked really hard to change our hiring practices so that we hire by panels and we have a person from our diversity and inclusion committee on those panels for every single hire in the office. And that has changed the numbers. You know, I think that um, also having uh, someone with my perspective, a different perspective, uh, lends itself to some additional kinds of innovation. We spend a lot of time dealing with the messes and the problems that come across our desk. I am more focused on what can we do to ensure that those things don't happen in the first instance. So I'm a big supporter of criminal justice reform, but I'm also mindful that a lot of the social determinants of whether or not somebody's gonna end up in our criminal justice system are determined by things like access to housing and education and childcare and food security. Let's focus and work on those things as we institute needed reform. I think about the work we're trying to do to combat the raging opioid crisis that today will claim six lives in Massachusetts. Untold more will be uh, dead but brought back to life through Narcan. We have more grandparents raising grandchildren in Massachusetts than ever before. It is devastating. So I am focused on certainly doing what I need to do to crack down on prescribers and dispensing practices. We're investigating opioid manufacturers and distributors, all of what you would expect. But you know, recently I decided that in the absence of statewide curriculum on youth opioid prevention, I was gonna work to provide that out of my office. And we partnered recently with GE to provide toolkits to every public middle school student in the state of Massachusetts that will give them the kind of training and awareness that they need to make healthy decisions. We did the similar thing when it, when it came to, to, to efforts to combat domestic violence and teen dating violence. Um, I was asked a couple of years ago, and this is going to be, I'm, I'll just, I, this, I'm in, I'm in um, uh, hot water probably in raising this topic, but we have a football team in, uh, in New England. And um, a few years ago, <laughs> a few years ago, uh, just to be clear, I wore my Eagles jersey a few weeks ago. I lost a bet, okay? <laughs> But, uh, and it wasn't my Eagles jersey, it was given to me, I was forced to wear it because I lost the bet. But, um, but I'll tell you, I was asked, I was asked a while back um, in the wake of um, a particular scandal, um, what my views of, of the NFL commissioner were and, and what needed to happen. As these are sometimes the um, sort of um, curious questions you get as attorney general and the people's lawyer when people think that you should be solving all problems. And what I said is that the NFL had its priorities misplaced, that they should focus on domestic violence, that they should focus on sexual violence and deal with that. That led to a call from Robert Kraft and a partnership I have with the New England Patriots. We call it game change. And this is, you know, two years before the emergence of Me Too, and I'm really glad of this program. We're in public high schools and now middle schools in the state teaching young people about how to identify the signs of teen dating violence, bullying, stalking, and then empowering them with the competencies to take that work um, on and to be the upstanders that, that they need to be. So, you know, uh, that's a little, bit of, uh, a little bit of the perspective I bring. Last week, we had a very big week in the office. Um, we, uh, within the last two weeks, we won huge victories in court over the NRA and ExxonMobil. And in both cases, it was, in both of those cases, it was women attorneys who drafted the briefs and made the arguments and got us those results. So I think um, my point is probably all too clear here. Uh, the, the, the need to uh, and the benefit of having a more representative office, having a more representative democracy is where we need to go as a general matter. Now, I knew in getting elected a little bit about this job because I worked in the Attorney General's office. I did not know that we were gonna have the last year and a half that we've had. And uh, you know, I was at the Women's March in Boston way back when President Trump was inaugurated. And my message then was, we'll see you in court. Because I had a view, I, d I had to admit, I didn't think it'd be so often or so soon. <laughs> 
But if he made good on one unconstitutional or illegal campaign promise after another, we were gonna use the recourse of the courts because that's my job, to fight for the rule of law and to fight for the Constitution and to make sure that people's rights are protected. It started out with a travel ban where the scoreboard right now for those counting reads still states three, Trump zero. It continued with protecting DREAMers and the DACA program, defending the Affordable Care Act where a number of us intervened in that case. Uh, more recently, filing suit to stop the proposed rule that was going to limit women's access for insurance coverage for needed contraception. I can't tell you the number of suits we're up to against Scott Pruitt and the EPA um, because uh, they are doing so much to undermine uh, the prerogatives that are so imperative in terms of protecting our planet and combating climate change, but also they're doing things that undermine my state's clean energy economy. And we've been successful. Um, on, that, uh, on that note, I'll just pause. You know, it was Massachusetts several years ago that brought a suit against the Bush administration and the EPA for its failure to regulate greenhouse gases. That case went up to the Supreme Court, and in June of 2007, the Supreme Court issued what has become a seminal opinion in environmental law, Massachusetts versus EPA, that basically ordered the EPA to do its job and to start the process of regulating greenhouse gases. So it's just an example of a time when a state AG sued the federal government, and that's what we're seeing right now with this administration. We've stopped attempts to roll back limits that were placed on methane emissions, on energy efficiency standards. I could go on and on and on. But again, we're there trying to hold the line in the face of an administration that has either abdicated its responsibility or has uh, worked to and is working to actively undermine the prerogative of, st prerogative of states to enforce the law. Betsy DeVos, in, as Secretary of Education, is a good example of this. Recently, we filed action in court against a loan servicer we felt was acting in ways that were predatory and harmful to students. Student loan debt, I don't have to tell people in this room, it's $1.3 trillion and growing in this country. The fastest form of debt, it's gonna be, it's, it's, it's just gonna be such a drag on our economy, we know this. So we've been really, really um, aggressive about combating abusive for-profit colleges that are raking it in on the backs of veterans and service members, single parents and the like. Uh, many of these students first in their family to go to college. We've also gone after predatory loan servicing practices. That's led us to take action against Betsy DeVos' state AGs. Why? Because she wants to roll back and throw out all the rules that were put in place under the Obama administration to protect students from predatory practices. And uh, recently, in one of our court cases where we've sued, her administration actually filed papers in court saying that we, as a state, don't have authority to enforce state consumer protection laws. <laughs> but fortunately, it's judges who get to decide these things. <laughs> and the judge ruled in that case that yes, state AG, you have the right to enforce state consumer protection law, move on with your case. So that's what we're doing. But that's an example of where we find ourselves right now, on the front lines, taking action, uh, trying to hold the line on any number of fronts. Some of you may have seen just a couple of weeks ago, uh, a most recent lawsuit, and that was around the census, right? The census is so important, you know, so important because it's just like fundamental to democracy and the electoral process, but it's also pretty important to states because it determines the allocation of funding, right? So we know what this effort is about um, on a number of fronts to disadvantage certain states and certainly to suppress the vote. And we've filed suit, and again, that's an example of the states rising up to say, this is not what is permitted under the Constitution, and we're gonna hold you accountable. As they say, we're probably, you know, we're more than two dozen suits in right now. We have yet to lose a case. Um, and that's sort of, you know, I, you know, I appreci appreciate the applause. I think it's been excellent lawyering and, and advocacy, but it's a rather sad commentary because what it illustrates is just how wrongheaded 
um, and how unwilling this administration is to play by basic rules and principles. And that's what we're fighting against. But this work that we're doing, you know, one of the great things is you see a lot of collective action, you know, and I think that's a wonderful thing when you see states working together um, on any number of, of issues of shared concern. And that's why I'm so pleased to have a new, a new partner here in New Jersey. Um, and, you know, he will be joining us, uh, California, New York, Illinois, others, Pennsylvania, who are really out there day after day on these issues. You know, um, from my perspective, it's pretty simple. It's about upholding some of the values, you know, that I grew up with and upholding the rule of law that I studied and what I learned in school all the way through law school. That's the role of state AGs, I think, in this time. I think all of this was described pretty well by Gloria Steinem. Remember seeing her, some of you, at the, at the march in DC? Remember her line, you know, where she reminded us that the Constitution, this country's Constitution, does not begin with the words, I the president. <laughs> it actually starts with we the people. We the people. Uh, that's what this is about. And, uh, and I don't have to tell you about the work we have ahead. We see uh, every day uh, what's happening right now. But I'm going to continue to look to do my job and certainly be in court as we need to to try to hold the line. I also believe deeply, though, it's a time for people to be more engaged. One of the greatest things that I've seen over the last year and a half, I'm doing a lot of town halls in Massachusetts, but I've been traveling around the country. The number of folks who are coming out, who are getting involved, particularly who've never been involved in politics before. That is so, so exciting and so necessary. The number of women who are running is off the charts. That, to me, is a very positive, positive thing. You know, I look across our legislative bodies, the numbers are, are uh, about 25%. We know Congress, you know these numbers far better than I do, Debbie, 20%, um, 6% of Fortune 500 CEOs. Um, any room I walk into, basically, you know, you, you see the disparity that's out there. I see it in my job. You know, it was uh, not too long ago, I was in a classroom in Boston, and I was speaking to a group of second graders, and I had read to them, and we were talking a little bit about the role of the Attorney General, and they knew it was a position of, of a certain, you know, import and power and authority and whatever. They understood all of that. Their teacher had done a wonderful job talking to them about, about who I was and, and what this was about. Towards the end, a gentleman walked in through the back door in the room, and he was wearing a suit. And a little boy immediately put his hand up and said to me, is he your boss? <laughs> and, you know, I think about, I, I think about that, and, and I think about the lens through which that little boy is experiencing life and the work that we have to do that's incumbent upon all of us to change culture, to change perception, I'm a big believer that seeing is believing, which is why I'm working hard to uh, recruit and elect women to office, particularly the office of attorney general, but office generally, because we need that kind of, of representation. You know, anytime um, I get discouraged and feel daunted by the tasks ahead, I think about those values and the community that I lived in growing up. And I believe that those values have been uh, with us since this institution, this very institution was founded and the farmhouse that I grew up in was built. Um, they've been with us far longer than any single administration will be with us. They are truly what make America great and they're what we've got to stick with now. I believe that with a lot of hard work and strong support of community and strong support of one another, we can actually accomplish a great deal and get things done. But in order to do that, we need to start to listen to one another, we need to work together, and we need to see the world through the lens and the experience of the other. You know, I fight every day uh, to, against the coarsening of the, uh, uh, of the discourse, of the breakdown of basic civility in, in our culture, in our society. And, you know, wherever we can, uh, I think, act in ways that are counter to that, model and show good ways, you know, others are going to take their, their, their cue from that. But we also, at the same time, can't be afraid to speak up. 
And uh, not only am I so heartened to see so many people turning out and engaged, and so many women in particular running, um, I'm so heartened to, to, to see uh, what's happened uh, recently with those who've bravely come forward to share their stories and say, it's not right, it happened to me too. You know, the incredible young people from Parkland, Florida, who gathered with communities of survivors from all walks of life and circumstance around this country and are standing up right now and speaking out to say never again. Uh, these are wonderful and inspirational times. And I think we've just got to seize that energy, uh, seize that momentum. Uh, I think young people, as they have at other times in our country's history, are the ones helping to show us the way. Uh, I know we're going to continue to keep hearing from them um, in the months ahead as we move towards November. But for your sake, uh, for our sake, for the sake of everyone who still believes in the promise of this great country, I'm actually more optimistic and more hopeful than ever before. We've gone through a lot of hurt. There's probably more hurt to come. But I think in the cauldron of all of this is an opportunity to fundamentally recognize and, and respect the democracy that we're supposed to have here in this country to live up to the aspirational uh, principles set out in the Constitution, which you know are only given life by people. We are the ones who have to animate that. And, and that's the opportunity that we have right now. Just the fact that I can walk into a room tonight and spend time, as somebody from Massachusetts, with all of you shows me that there is a level of engagement, a level of interest that is really, really powerful. So I want to thank you. Uh, for your engagement, I look forward to what we can accomplish in the time ahead. I know it's not going to be easy, um, but nothing of consequence, nothing of meaning rarely is, because the easy way out is ultimately rarely satisfied. Um, but we will get there. And to the young people in the room tonight, thank you for being here. Um, thank you for your engagement. You're what it's all about. And as I say, there are a lot of others who are going to try to stand in the way. Um, and get in the way, but never lose the idealism, never lose the energy. And uh, I know there are going to be many, many who are going to be allies alongside you and with you as we go forward. Thank you again, Debbie, and thank you so much to Pop. Well, now I know why Judy was so excited about your run. Um, you, are, you do actually totally epitomize everything. I think I can speak for all of us at the Center for American Women in Politics. It's why we get up and do the work that we do, is because we believe that having women like you in office makes a difference. And you're showing it absolutely today in, in all the work that you're doing. So thank you. The Attorney General is graciously going to ans answer some questions. Um, and I think, is Pooja? out there with the microphone. Ben has the microphone. Pooja, can you get it from there? Kelly has the microphone. OK. So Kelly and Kelly, you want to give it to Pooja? We'll hand it off. There we go. So because we're recording, we are going to ask you to use the microphone and just say your name and then ask your question. And so I'm going to let you field the question. Great. Right here. Right here. Hi, my name is Kathy Kleeman, and I'm from Red Sox Nation. <laughs> <laughs> We're off to a good start. Yeah, oh, yeah. A record start. I can get home tonight and yeah. listen to the game. Um, my question is about partisanship among attorneys general, because you, know, you stand for certain things because you're a state attorney general, but presumably you have Republican counterparts. And I'm curious how how and when you're able to work together, when, you know, when your partisan differences are bigger, and when your role as attorney general is what brings you together? Yeah. Well, it's a great question. And we meet regularly as a group. All of us come together a few times a year. And there are some areas where we're working together. There are probably 44 of us that are engaged in this multi-state investigation, largest public health investigation of its kind into the opioid manufacturers and distributors. We do a lot of common work to combat issues of, say, human trafficking and the like. But I'll be honest with you, over the last 10 years or so, uh, we've seen, unfortunately, a breakdown there. Um, 
there was a wave election in 2010, and unfortunately, some came in who had a view that uh, Democratic and Republican AGs should be meeting separately. Um, organizations formed, the Republican ones started first, and then later, um, as more and more money was being contributed to that, the Democrats decided they needed to form a counter. We still meet as a group, but unfortunately, um, there isn't as much work together as I think Americans would like and deserve. And, you know, I'm somebody who's about that. I want to work across the aisle. I think there is far more that unites us in this country than divides us, and it's up to us and those in office to find that commonality and to work through it. Now, you know, um, it's been an interesting sort of probably 12 years, if you look at the history, 10 years. There was a time when a group of AGs were suing the Obama administration left and right, Scott Pruitt probably leading the charge. There was a fellow who ultimately became the governor of Texas, Greg Abbott, who said famously that his job every day was to get up, go to work, sue the Obama administration, and go home. I have to say I find that offensive as a lawyer. My job is to enforce the law, to uphold the rule of law, and to fight for the Constitution, particularly when it's undermined at the highest levels of our government. It is true that a group of us have been suing, and suing quite a bit in the last year and a half, but those suits are made in the interest of standing up for people's rights, our industries, our economies, and our values. And, and I say that, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm brought back to the Muslim ban, you know? A group of us AGs were actually meeting uh, together on a Friday afternoon when we got news that this Muslim ban was, was announced. And I flew back to Boston that Saturday, and I remember landing at 4 o'clock in the afternoon, and I asked uh, to be brought over to the International Terminal. And I saw an amazing sight, lawyers volunteering, leaving kids' birthday parties and basketball games to go to the airport to offer their services. You know, translators, um, counselors and the like showing up. And, and uh, it was an amazing uh, ensuing hours as we worked feverishly to prepare papers to get into court. I remember calling our U.S. attorney Saturday night to ask him to find lawyers uh, to get into court so that they could defend and represent our United States of America. You know, the calls that I got um, in the wake of that, many from our immigrant groups, but so many from our colleges and universities who had students and professors affected by this, our major teaching hospitals who are depending on star research fellows coming over from, from overseas. In Massachusetts, as with New Jersey, we have a vibrant tech and life sciences economy. You know, and that kind of order uh, undermines our ability to have the kind of global workforce that we need. So, you know, sure, I got into court because I thought that that order was unconstitutional, and it was also harmful to Massachusetts residents and our economy, businesses, and interests. And so I try to make decisions about who to sue and how that are burdened by facts and policy and implications, and that's what we're going to continue to do, you know? Uh, burdened by, I should say, informed by. Um, but. You know, my point is, um, I, I hope we get to a place where there's greater opportunity to work together, but uh, I think some are, are afraid to, to, to act in the face of what they perceive as retaliation. Yes. Hi, hi, my name is Mike Brown. I'm from East Brunswick. Could you talk a little bit about the relationship between the AGs of each state? Mm -hmm. I guess in Massachusetts in particular, and the uh, uh, federal uh, um, attorneys, the US, US attorneys, attorneys yeah. uh, on the one hand, and also uh, include a little talk about, so someone in, uh, the, the US attorney indicts somebody, they, they are unsuccessful for whatever reason, there's also a violation of state law. How does the state pick up on that and mm -hmm. so on? That yeah. whole interplay, which All is right. a big deal now, right? Yeah. All right. No, I, I'll try to give it to you. I'll try to give it to you in a nutshell, okay? Um, I am somebody, as the, the, the vast majority of AGs are, who is an independently elected constitutional officer. New Jersey has a different system where it's an appointment by the governor. But us state AGs, for the most part, um, are autonomous in the sense that you know we were voted in and, uh, and and we have the autonomy to set up our offices, decide which cases to bring, where to put resources. My office 
85 uh, percent of the work that we do is to enforce laws that are there to uh, protect the environment, consumers, workers, you name it, civil rights. It's, it's uh, civil. Uh, we also represent the state when, when the state is sued. But 15 percent of it is criminal. In a U.S. attorney's office, and the criminal work that I do is largely around large-scale gun and, and drug trafficking operations, uh, human trafficking, gaming, financial fraud. U.S. attorney's offices have a more limited jurisdiction, and um, probably what you hear most about is their criminal enforcement. And at the end of the day, they report to the U.S. Department of Justice, so in this case, uh, uh, Attorney General Jeff Sessions. Um, and each U.S. attorney in the different districts is appointed by the president. So they're really quite, quite different. Our overlap, you know, what will happen typically is there may be a matter that comes in, and our teams may consult just to say, just to talk through the issue of whether or not um, it's, it's better for their office or our office to take the case. Um, but uh, a lot of it is just done sort of separately. There's an issue that's come up with respect to state investigations right now, and what does that mean, um, whether it's in the question of pardons or other things. Uh, you can pardon federal offenses, you can't pardon state offenses. Um, and obviously state AGs, you know, are, are the ones who are pursuing and, and investigating violations of, of criminal and, and, and civil laws within their jurisdictions. I hope that gives you uh, gives you uh, the kind of answer that you're looking for. Okay. Hi, I'm Ben, and I've uh, come down from the law school in Newark with one of my colleagues who is oh, actually nice. one of your constituents. Nice. Uh, right. My question is, in this era of politicization of mm -hmm. the judiciary, of the Department of Justice, of state AGs, what is your advice, especially to young people like us that are starting out in a legal career, to make sure that the public has confidence that when the Constitution is being enforced, when important issues are being looked at, that they're not being done through a partisan bent, and they're being done because they're important. Yeah. It seems to be a big problem today. Well, um, and, and there are certain actors in government who've not th done themselves any service. Um, you know, and I take a lot of offense to that. It's unfortunate. What I would say is we need great lawyers in government. You know, I, I graduated from law school. I clerked for a federal judge in Boston. I then went on to private practice. I worked for about eight years at a large firm representing mostly corporate clients. Um, and uh, in fact, used to I remember making a few trips to New Jersey to spend time with clients here. Um, but then made the switch to the attorney general's office. And I've never looked back. We need great lawyers in government. For those, uh, I've talked to many who are in government right now, I encourage them to stay the course. We need you there doing the work. Administrations change. Um, but what you hope abides is this understanding that we have sworn an oath to uphold the Constitution and the rule of law and, and to do that um, with respect and to, to do that faithfully. Um, and that's something, you know, that as lawyers, we, we, you know, remember, you will swear an oath to that. And uh, I hope it's something that, uh, that people always follow faithfully. Um, despite what may come in terms of pressures or the like. I think the best way to do stuff is just do your job, you know? Do your job, get results, prove yourself that way, and people will see over time. But we certainly, I think, need to do everything we can to support those who want to enter public service um, and, and do work on behalf of people. So good luck to you. That's great. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Hi, uh, Jeff Davis from Marlboro. On, on a humorous note, I'd like to see Debbie create an award, the Purple Heart for Attorney Generals, because you definitely deserve it. Oh, thank you. <laughs> or you're going to earn it anyway, the okay. hard way. Uh, I have issue with the cabinet choices that, that the president has nominated that you mentioned a, a few. There's other ones that are mm -hmm. just not qualified for the job. I think that, or I'm hoping that in 2020 we'll flip and we'll have Democrats taking over both houses and the presidency. What's the legality of passing a law? Because you have some influence. You also have Elizabeth Warren in, from your state to basically tell candidates for secretaries and cabinet positions not to take the job if you're not qualified. If not, <laughs> things will happen. To, I, I know it's crazy, but never before have we had four or five or six cabinet folks that are just not qualified. Yeah. 
Well, I think that's what the confirmation process is about. I think that's why it's really important that we elect people to the Senate and in Congress who are going to do their job in vetting and through the committees and ultimately through through any hearings. Um, you know, the president elections matter and elections have consequences and there's a lot of there's a lot of room there. Um, and I hope that's why uh, as we go forward, more people will pay attention and will register to vote and will actually get to uh, get to the ballot box so that we give ourselves the best shot as we go forward. Yes. Hi, I'm Sue Carroll from the Center for American Women in Politics, and I want to ask you a different kind of question, um, which connects, your, connects to your background as a professional athlete. Um, I, we're interested in getting more women to run for office, and even though we've got a lot running this particular election, relatively speaking, we still need a lot more. And, um, and one of the things we need to do, I think, is try to get women who are prof leaders in other kinds of fields to see the importance of getting involved in politics mm -hmm. and public leadership. And so I was wondering if you had any thoughts about professional athletes um, and how to reach them and make that connection because, you know, they're great leadership skills that are taught in athletics, I think, and a lot of professional athletes, women professional athletes, have a lot of good leadership skills, but rarely do they make the connection to getting involved in politics and public service. So I'm just interested in your thoughts on that and well, how you go about um, that. You know, I'm hoping that I can be an example of that working and more people will run. I was talking to Coach Stringer about that tonight um, because I think that there are studies that show, you know, if you look at women who are CEOs, more of them tend to have had a college athletic background. And, you know, I don't know if it's chicken and egg or, or, or what. All I know is that there's a correlation there. And uh, for all the reasons you say, you know, to, uh, well, with respect to any endeavor, passion, the arts, dance, you know, it doesn't much matter. But for me, you know, sports was, was it. And I learned a lot about drive, determination, stick to it um, When I was running and everybody was sort of poo-pooing me, I just treated the whole campaign like a season. And every day you were just going to get out there and get after it and, you know, scramble to meet as many people as possible. Being in debates, um, you know, it was like being at the free throw line, right? You know, um, you know, it, there were just so many correlations, and I think that my background really, really helped. I I had to raise some money, um, and 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 I raised some money, but only enough to afford one 30-second spot. But that 30-second spot had basketball in it, and uh, it was the one thing that people, you know, actually remembered, because there is something about, a, you know, sports and a commonality that people see. I think a lot of fathers saw uh, and thought of their daughters, um, and I think uh, a lot of women. You know, it wasn't just women who played sports. You know, something resonated there. But I would love to pursue that because uh, we can't let any more time go by. I have fundamentally reached the view. You know, we've had a power and balance uh, from, from the dawn of time here, at least recorded history, if not before, right? Uh, and we know who's been in charge. Um, and I think that, you know, it's, it's time to, to even that up. And I think that we'll see, we'll see some different results as we go forward. Um, that's not to diminish the efforts of so many wonderful men uh, who are in office, who uh, I work alongside. But it is to say that we are missing out as a country, as a society. We, we are not recognizing and harnessing the skills, the talents, the experiences, the perspectives that women, and by the way, all those others who've been marginalized along the way, um, are not able and haven't been able to bring to the table. So I would love to pick up with that because I think it's a great formula and I'm happy to, to get on board with any uh, recruitment uh, uh, effort. She and Coach Stringer are going to get into Yeah, we'll take it on the road. Yes. Hi, my name is Mary DeStefano and I'd like to go back to a little brief thing that you said. I'm a retired school nurse mm. and I work with a group called Community in Crisis that started about three years ago to address the opioid crisis. Um, they're primarily centered in uh, the Basking Ridge, Bernard's area. And <clears throat> I've also done or served 27 years as a volunteer EMS. Mm. So um, to wit, the nasal spray Narcan is given to all the first responders gratis at this point. And there's a lot of talk that everyone should should have the ability and the training to use Narcan, um, like CPR. However, nasal spray and Narcan 
whether it's, um, in, and there is also uh, a self injector mm -hmm. like um, EpiPens mm -hmm. that, but the cost is $273 plus or minus. With your work with GE and so forth and so on, has, has anyone addressed the issue of bringing down the cost of the nasal or the injectable Narcans? Um, right now, all the first responders get it free through a fund grant in the state, but everyone I've talked to so far, um, and this includes Atlantic Healthcare, mm -hmm. Robert Wood Johnson, they don't know how long that free funding is yes. gonna go on. Um, well, great question, and uh, I love that you're a school nurse. Um, I love that you're a school nurse. I come from a long line of nurses. My mom was mom, my grandmother, my great aunt, but I was afraid of blood, so I ended up going to <laughs> law school. Narcan is so important. I'll tell you what I did uh, when I got elected. We noticed that the price of Narcan was going up and up. We actually reached out to Amphistar, the then largest maker of Narcan, and asked some questions that resulted in an agreement whereby they agreed to lower the dose to $20, for uh, uh, everybody in the state in terms of purchasing. And I contributed settlement funds from suits against pharmaceutical companies and others, as well as some of our forfeiture funds to fund Narcan. So it is now available in Massachusetts that way. Yeah, I just, no, I think, look, uh, you don't ever want cost to get in the way of saving a person's life. And, you know, while this is a Band-Aid of sorts, it's saving lives. And we need to do everything we can to address our, our behavioral health parity or lack of parity, I should say. Um, and, and fundamentally, the, the, the failure to have enough options in terms of, of the kind of treatment that you need. But we need to do everything we can to make Narcan available, uh, as widely available as, as possible. I, right. No, no, I, I'm happy to talk to you about what we've done in Massachusetts. Yes. I heard so much about you. My name is Bernice Venable. And um, I would have parked, double parked on Route 1. <laughs> I'm, I'm thinking the more you talk, I think I would have triple parked. Okay. <laughs> but. And I know with all the judges in here and attorney generals, they would have gotten me out of jail. Yeah. But at any rate, <laughs> I'm very serious about young people. Mm -hmm. I'm just listening to the nurse and the others mm -hmm. speak. Um, I am, I, I'm just so into hearing what you said about your, your coming ups mm -hmm. <laughs> in Massachusetts and this single parent and the five kids and the people around. Um, I feel so much like you in a way because I came from a small town and I was orphaned mm. at 13. And it was the community, it was the school system, and all of these people and my foster mother who just grabbed me and just pulled me along. Someone did that for you. Mm. And I just see it in you. And, and you've already talked about what you're doing with the, the second graders. Um, all of the people in the schools, et cetera, and having been a, um, a retired school superintendent, mm. I know how critical it is. Mm -hmm. And my point, the lenses that I'm looking at right now, these young people, two folks sitting next to me, and all the rest of them in here, I know that we can't clone all of them, but what is it that you are doing now, besides the fact that you've hired so many women, and I think that's tremendous. But in your office, have you ever thought about it, maybe you do it already, having internships, or if not you, the other six or seven attorney generals around the country who, uh, who happen to be very similar to you. If there is a way to bring these young people together in a situation or an atmosphere like you're in, so that they are learning from you because they cannot get it through osmosis. Somebody like you has to do it. And I was wondering if you have well, an internship program. Do, hey, Beatrice, thank you so much. And thank you for will your willingness to go uh, park miles away. I appreciate that. Um, listen, this stuff is really important. You know, the other thing I did is I hired a, a chief of diversity and organizational development. Our numbers are much more diverse. You got to be really intentional and you got to follow through with that. We have internship programs right now for high school, college, and law school students. I want that pipeline. Nothing makes me happier than when we have 
folks come back who were a high school intern, college intern, because I go back in the office, I used to work there before, you know, who now are assistant attorneys general, right? So that, that work is so important. The other thing that I do that I hope others do is I've set up councils. I've got a group of folks, uh, a, a disability council or a, a, a racial justice council, uh, a council on new Americans, um, a council on labor. And I'm meeting regularly and my teams are with people from the community and different stakeholder groups. Why? Because that should inform how policies are made, how decisions are made, how I allocate you know, resources, how I hear about you know, problems and then can take action. And, uh, and I think that's what government's gotta be about. You know, we're supposed to be there to serve people and, and we've gotta start by opening it up um, from within the office and hiring, but also you know, making clear that, that we're gonna have ongoing uh, dialogue. And thank you for your work as a uh, as school superintendent. I, you know, I, it was just um, we just celebrated the 50th anniversary of the Fair Housing Act. Um, it followed on the heels of of uh, memorials uh, commemorating the 50th anniversary of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s assassination. And I spoke the other day to a group of fair housing advocates, and I'm really passionate about this, recognizing that, you know, to use a basketball analogy. It, it, it's just not the same baseline, okay? Um, it is not the same baseline, and let's just recognize that. There are problems of fundamental unfair, unfairness in our society, and I think one of the rules of government, and hopefully one of the um, uh, feelings of the collective is the recognition that we gotta do everything we can to level up that baseline. People are gonna make of their opportunities what they will, and some will fail, some will succeed. But we gotta deal with some of the baseline foundational issues. And the problems that we don't deal with today, you came through the foster care system. I think regularly about the kids, and we have thousands and thousands of kids in Massachusetts who are dependent upon us, the state, for their hopes and dreams and future and livelihood. You know, that is a precious responsibility, and it's one that we all share, and we can't do enough. So I get really annoyed. You know what I get annoyed with sometimes? Is the people who tell me that they're socially liberal but fiscally conservative. Because <laughs> I would like to understand what that means, you know, as a value proposition. I actually know what that means. But, you know, it's about being honest about some of this, because if you talk about the social determinants of health, of well-being in our communities, of what's happening in our criminal justice system, you know, if we don't make these investments now, you know, we're just going to pay for it big time later. So even if you don't care about humanity, you know, and you care about your wallet, know that, you know, our failure to address these things uh, will hurt us as, as a society and as a country. Yeah. I'm Kelly Dittmar, I'm a scholar at the Center for American Women in Politics, so thank you for being here. I should be asking you questions. Um, um, no, don't advice. worry, I'm gonna um, have you do work for us. Okay. So, <laughs> so one of the questions, one of the things that we've come to, that this is a benefit of having more women in office, is thinking about what happens once you're in, and how do you help women then advance to the next level? Um, and so, not only in your own experience, um, but working with other women in office, you said you confronted barriers in your path, you know, people saying you shouldn't run. Um, what about the next step? Have you seen that um, those challenges exist for you or other women who are AGs thinking about perhaps governor? We know that's a good path. Um, but, you know, other offices, are those challenges, do they still exist in your experience? And what can an organization like ours and us as just supporters of women in politics do to be sure that once women are in, we continue to support their journey in office? Well, I, um, I, I really appreciate that question. Um, and certainly the goal, that's good. Because <laughs> um, I'd like to stay in office. And uh, you know, I think a few things. One, I fundamentally see misogyny every day in my job. I get called honey and kiddo. Um, from time to time from well-intentioned people who have no idea that they even maybe just said that or how problematic that is. Um, it's, uh, it, you know, I mentioned the, the, the little eight-year-old, right? Um, you know, it's just part of, of, of what is all too often baked in. And I think that I need to just continue to, you know, be myself and, and hold this position. One of the heartening things, though, that I uh, see is, is uh, women coming up to me who've maybe heard me out at a town hall and a year later got elected to school committee or select woman or something, you know? That's what I want to inspire. 
Um, but you know, I think we just need more of us to uh, to to be able to to uh, to make real movement. Unfortunately, when it comes to state AGs, we've actually gone backwards. There were more attorneys, women AGs in in your time when you served than there are right now, and that's why I'm leading an effort nationally to try to recruit women to run for that position. I think tracking of language is important, you know, and and studying and pointing that out. Um, uh, the misogyny that exists, the, the, uh, the, the other isms that exist out there in the discourse, calling that out. Um, I was recently out meeting with a group of, of, of women under 40 who work in, in Hollywood, right? They're the writers, some actors, some producers. And it's really exciting that they are engaged and fired up and thinking about that platform, right? Um, and, 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 and looking to be intentional in that, in that platform. So I think that you know, you're continuing to study and report on what's actually happening out there will benefit all of us and certainly hopefully change some of the perception and culture um, to make it uh, more likely that more women are going to run and run successfully. Um, I don't look to many still, unfortunately, like an attorney general. I don't look, unfortunately, to many like a governor or a CEO. You know, um, that's just, I think, the reality of, of people's perception out there. Now, we're going to change that. And, um, <laughs> you know, it's, uh, it's, but, but, but it's ongoing work, you know, when, when, you, when you confront it every day. I don't let it bother me. It doesn't bother me. Um, <laughs> but, but it is, you know, reflective of where we're at. Yeah. Yes. This is so exciting. You know, I don't get to do much courtroom work. I don't do any courtroom work at all. So I feel like I'm like in a courtroom behind this. It's very exciting for me. Well, talking yes. about language, is there any way legally to rein in the atrocious speech of our president by uh, actual speech or by Twitter, you know, such, such as calls to lock her up or lock him yeah. up uh, against yeah. some citizen who he has no business doing that. I feel like I should have filed a single complaint back, you know, 16 months ago seeking an injunction against any activity on his part that was going to affect my state. You know, um, I'll tell you what, it, I, I think the way to do that is to, uh, to do it at the ballot box. We do have uh, something called the First Amendment. Um, though it doesn't protect everything, and it actually doesn't protect lines, so we'll see how this goes. But, um, you know, I, I think the, the best way to do that is to model good behavior, uh, get back to basic values, teach respect, engage with young people. You know, in this culture, what I see in young people, and I don't know if you'd see it if you were back in school today, you know, young people are stressed out, you know, and they're not, we've got this iPhone culture where everything is immediate, we've disconnected. You literally are sitting next to one another in texting instead of actually talking. Um, and we've somehow got to find a way, I think, as a society to sort of, you know, break through uh, some of that so that we don't have a complete breakdown in, in the dialogue. Um, I think electing people who uh, engage um, uh, with a certain decorum, who, who can disagree but do so agreeably, you know, um, that's what we got to look for, and those are the kinds of folks we got to support getting into office who are going to uh, going to show show uh, show a better example. So I'm sorry that the answer to that is probably a definitive no, <laughs> but there are other means too. One last question. Sure. Yes. You've, uh, my name is Ellen Brown, and you've been wonderful about advocating for advancement of women, more visibility of women, but I think part of that um, education process has to include men. Mm -hmm. And I think particularly younger men, like that, not as necessarily as young as the little boy you mm -hmm. mentioned, but when, when he, when this guy in the suit walked in the door and, and he asked you if mm -hmm. that's your boss, you could have said, I'm his boss. Mm -hmm. But I mean, there has to be some kind of a psychological boundary that gets crossed so that young men or boys in the learning stage are not intimidated mm -hmm. or feel less masculine or it's an us versus them. Yeah. So how do you go about doing that? 
You know, it's a it's a great comment and an important comment. Um, you know, I I think it's important to recognize what what everybody's bringing to the table. And you know, in I'll use an example in the Me Too moment. I think that there's opportunity there to address behavior that is completely over the line and reprehensible and criminal. Um, there's also an opportunity for education and engagement, right? To have the conversation along the lines of, you know what, that offends me, this is why, you know, and this is how we gotta do things. With the young people, I think, you know, a great way to do it is to just um, uh, show them women in, in in leadership, you know, Becky Hammond, she's a woman who's coaching in the W in the NBA, not WNBA right now. Um, expose them to, to women in elected office. You know, how many newscasters had to correct themselves the other night when they referred to the pilot as he, right? So we know we got a lot of work to do. Um, your point is so well taken. Uh, and wherever we can can work with, with young people and show them a better way, um, you know, one of the things I guess I take from the marriage equality work in Massachusetts is that we have now um, kids who aren't even kids anymore, but certainly young people today in Massachusetts and little kids generally are growing up in our state with this understanding that you can be married to a man, you can be married to a woman. And I've literally been part of conversations between little kids where they're asking the other, well, who do you want to marry? You know, who do you want to marry? <laughs> And um, you see it too that there are certain things that just aren't uh, aren't a thing. You know, I spent time with Emma Gonzalez a few weeks ago, and uh, you know, it's something that her th that's just not a, her, her sexual orientation, not a thing, right? I mean, that's a that's the positive right now. We just need to 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 see that more developed when it comes to gender, when it comes to race. We got a lot of a lot of work to do. But again, I want to thank you all for being out. I want you to um, you know. It, I try to publish and put out through my website, uh, morahealy.com, or um, my Massachusetts Attorney General site, you know, news of what we're doing across a lot of fronts, the lawsuits, the actions, the results. Um, and I want people to be aware of that because I want people uh, to be aware of what's possible, you know, in this time and, uh, and what we can do uh, together and, and also how necessary it is. And, you know, I, I will leave you with my final story, and that is this. Travel ban comes down, and we immediately rush into court as lawyers and, you know, three times hold that at bay. Last December, we got a disappointing ruling from the Supreme Court. It allowed parts of that ruling to go into effect. Um, now, along the way, I'd met a woman who said that she was so upset about the Muslim ban that she had never done this before, but had decided to start volunteering to teach English as a second language to new refugees to Massachusetts. And she was doing that an afternoon every week. And in December, um, I was so disheartened by that Supreme Court ruling, but I thought about that woman. I thought about that woman. I thought about the lives that she had impacted in the preceding 45 weeks, right? And the difference that she had made as a single individual, giving of her time and talent. Everybody's got agency. You know, everybody's got something to offer in our society. And right now, it's about finding a way to tune into that, turn that up, turn that on. Um, the power has and always will be with the people. And, uh, and now is the people's time, and that'll be my last comment as the people's lawyer. Thanks for having me.